everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my, well, I, you know what? I'll minute. be honest. Wait, I've only got uh, one. Well, I've got two fabulous co-hosts, but I've only got one of your regular co-hosts with me due to some uh, family emergency. I only have one regular co-host, and that is... It's me, Diana. And then this is was very fortunate that we had uh, a special guest lined up. But uh, our special guest, you were, you're going to be promoted to a special guest slash co-host for today. So mm-hmm. we have three people, and it is... It's me. It's Nick Green. I'm honored to have the special guest uh, role today. Just my benefit by a family emergency. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, Nick. Yes, thank you. So we, we were very fortunate that we were going to be talking about getting up, getting moving, and who would we ask to be on the show, but serendipitously, Revered Nick, guest. Revered guest, yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you might remember from one of our bonus episodes, we had Nick on, and one of our old grab bags, we talked about Nick's study on getting people to stand up within within periods of time for their health that's right getting up and moving is super important the catchphrase sitting is the new smoking it's out there gotta be active all the time guys yeah that's a good catchphrase yeah it gets catchy in that yeah i'll I'll do um i'm I'm fresh off a, a conference from the weekend and um it's uh the the old uh journalists you know use the sitting as the new smoking and so this will be my my PSA, my public service announcement of, you know, the the number shakedown to when you have a bunch of people in a in a in a study and you count count up the years who's alive at the end, smoking a cigarette ends up taking 11 minutes off your life, whereas too much sitting or sedentary behavior for every hour that you sit, you lose 22 minutes out of your life. So mathematically, wow. if you look at it that way, sitting is actually kind of worse than smoking. So if you're listening to this. So you should only smoke standing up. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. You, okay. can, you can cancel it out that way. Yeah, you can do all kinds of fun numbers. But um, yeah, it's, the statistics, when you start looking at there are kind of alarming. And so that's kind of been my my kind of calling here with getting people moving. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share what I know about everything I've learned to the, the articles we're going to discuss today. Awesome. That is awesome. So, Nick, you're the CEO of BehaviorFit.com. Uh, folks might have mm-hmm. heard you in that previous episode, but in case they did not or we've got some new listeners, could you could you give everyone sure. a little quick summary of who you are and what you do? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, again, my name is uh, Nick Green. Um, I am a third-year PhD student at the University of Florida in a behavioral health and technology lab where we study healthy behavior change. Um, and uh, health is a result of um, either – doing a lot of good behaviors or doing a lot of bad behaviors. And so we can measure those things. And so I'm lucky to have an opportunity to study uh, research at UF. I mean, you know, my business at, I have my behavior fit company and website where um, it's really infusing my passion of health and fitness with uh, organizational behavior management and behavioral science of trying to get people to, to move more in which, you know, I'm really passionate about starting a movement about movement just so people can have healthier lives. Did you nice. write, did you write that one, Nick, or did you have to pay someone to come up with the movement about movement? That's good. <laughs> no, that's... It, it it came to me. I had to I had to think about it. I'm like that that's a catchy one. I like it. Uh, that's excellent. Yeah, I I can't take a full credit for that. I've I've read a lot of a lot of books recently, and one of by Simon Sinek of Finding Your Why, and it mm-hmm. kind of has a skeleton framework of you got to do something so that people do something, and so his is to inspire others to do the things that they are inspired to do so it's kind of circular in a weird nice. way but yeah. like i can borrow that i like movement so mine's a, to start a movement about physical movement so people can be healthier Excellent. that's awesome i also yeah. like the point that you made there that health is a resultant condition from mm-hmm. actual behavior that you engage in and i think yeah. that that's a good point to make right so that mm-hmm. health or weight loss can't be yep. your dependent variable in your study, right? right. It's sort of a collateral outcome of actual mm-hmm. behavior change. So mm-hmm. I think that's a good point to bring up because sometimes you'll hear people say, well, "I want to, I want to study weight loss. I want to do weight loss." But mm-hmm. weight loss is a result of engaging in presumably right. more exercise yeah. or, or better eating habits or something like that. So yeah, that's exactly right. And um, you know, a lot of the times we might not uh, think about measuring those healthy behaviors because they're new and different to us we're not formally trained in them so um, it's just a matter of kind of looking just a little bit deeper about yeah how is health what we're looking at do we want to increase decrease blood pressure whatever it is it's going to be a result of our activity levels obviously some some food choices and 
whatever else our, our bodily environment is made up of at that time. Right. So like right now in my house, I have about mm, 20 pounds of Halloween candy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's an estimate. It's going down every day though. So that's the good news. <laughs> Whoa, yes. Yeah, that's good. Your environment's changing. I think, yeah, right? I think it's good. Yeah. It's I think the, um, there, there, there was a recent analogy, you know, for just talking about like health in general, it's like, um, food and the magic bullet uh, pill and things like mm-hmm. that of like this one food item is that going to be you know the change and if we're behavioral scientists we're thinking well we're looking at functional relationships between the ivs and the dvs sure that's good that that one that one change that one dose of me- medicine that dose of exercise could could be the thing but we each have individual learning histories that are so different that you know you could be making this change to a Cadillac or you can make, be making the change to um, a broken down Oldsmobile. And so, you know, you can think about your health that way. You know, it's like, well, you know, is this change yes. going to be something important that's going to mean anything? And there's a, there's a lot of contextual variables. So, yes, health is behavior. Good point. I like the car analogy <laughs> there, right? Like you yeah, can't just hang an air freshener in the window and call it a day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, are we treating symptoms? Are we treating the root causes? All, it, you can start peeling back the layers real fast. Yeah. Well, so mm-hmm. we will be talking about uh, two kind of two articles to start on movement, and then uh, Nick, I know you you let us know that you had done a, done a couple more studies of your own since the last time we talked. So we're going to talk about those as well. Yep. But why don't right, we yeah. why don't we start with the studies because they're kind of brief. I you know I don't know if if you would expect to see a little bit more in some of these fitness articles, but they're. You know, they seemed a little light, but maybe that's maybe that's sort of the the face of, of research in in exercise uh, given or in, in movement. These aren't even about exercise necessarily. So our two articles: effects of a variable ratio reinforcement schedule with changing criteria on exercise in obese and non-obese boys by Deluca and Holborn from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1992. <laughs> and step it up using the good behavior game to increase physical activity with elementary school students at recess from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2017. This one's hot off the presses uh, by Galbraith and Normand. And, of course, the good that... behavior game. We are, we're big fans of the good behavior game yeah, here. So that's, that's what jumped out at us at first when, okay. I was, when I was doing a, we were doing a little dive into recent research. Wasn't that a series of movies? Were they called Step It Up? Step up. Step up. Step up with. Uh, oh, step up. Oh God, like, what's his face? That's like a dance movie, right? Yeah, yeah it has. Uh, oh, he's famous now. Magic Mike. Um, Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum. I think he's in there. Really? I yeah, think that's where I he got his that, start. Yeah. Take he's he's a, he's a good dancer. Yeah. I haven't seen Magic Mike, but I've seen his moves on a TV show. I think. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so you, dancing we is a good place in, to start. We saw him in Twenty Two Jump Street. And Twenty One uh, Jump Street. Yeah. That was pretty funny. Those wow. were pretty funny until I fell asleep. <laughs> like most movies, they were great until we <laughs> fell asleep watching them. Step up. Yeah. So, okay. Unre- anyway, so, sorry. So, Magic Mike is unrelated to <laughs> right. Step Up and the Good Behavior Game. Got it. True. <laughs> but we will we'll talk about the Good Behavior Game. All right. Well, why don't we start with the uh, changing criterion exercise, the cycling for both right. obese and not obese boys? I'm going to cover that one. So, we're taking it all the way back to 1992 with this article, which is a, like Rob mentioned, it's a relatively brief report. But what they were looking to do here was increase the exercise, uh, specifically stationary bike riding, everyone's favorite exercise, of six 11-year-old boys, three of whom uh, fell within the acceptable range for their weight for their height, and three who were over the weight for their height ratio. And they, it was a relatively simple study and a design so there was a follow-up, wasn't it, to or, or was it an extension, replication? I feel like I read a very similar one about oh, yeah. stationary bikes and and token economies, but I don't think it was this exact same one. But I might be putting the two together. I don't know. Was it that Black Mirror episode? No, it was not that Black Mirror episode mm-hmm. where they all have to ride the bikes in the future. <laughs> that that hasn't happened yet in, in 1992. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. They they, pre- they cited a lot of their previous research, the Deluca 85 and 90 study. That's about, probably it then. Yeah. About FI schedules, or in this study, they looked at VR schedules. Yeah, here it was a VR. So they had their stationary exercise bicycles hooked up uh, so that they could measure the number of responses, which was the number of um, 
what's the what is revolutions? this called? Revolutions. Yes. Yeah, the mean revolution. So the, <laughs> Thank you. The pedal, the pedal going around the cycle. Yeah, yeah. There we go. The mean revolutions of the pedal. How many radians was that, Diana? Do you remember? <laughs> uh, no. That's all I remember about that unit in math is the word radian, <laughs> and it's a circle thing. It's a circle thing. It's a circle thing. That's funny. I don't know. So they they hooked their bicycles up so that every time they met this criterion, which was a variable ratio, there was an illuminated, uh, specifically a seven watt illuminated red light. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, I mean, they're very technological in their description of the bike, so that's good. And a bell that went off. Okay, so that uh, first of all, they set that up. The way that they determined the when that was going to go off, that part was all hidden from the participants. And the bikes were set to a moderately low resistance for all subjects. And then what what I did appreciate about this is they did some initial baseline to determine where each of the boys was at when they started. They had eight sessions of baseline. And from that, they determined the mean revolutions of the bike, where they should start from there. And then they set an individual criterion for each of them for the first session from there. So I really liked that, that everyone was, was not expected to do the same level. They met everyone where they were at. Which is mm-hmm. a good way to start because you want the kids to be successful. I, I before I get into this, I do hate the title. Sorry, not to be negative. The title, but the I body just body shaming title. Yeah, title? like obese mm-hmm. and non-obese. I mean, I guess at this point, this article is like twenty-five years old, so I feel yeah. like you wouldn't write that as your title now. But the reasons why they were, you know, looking at the study were good. They wanted to see for any eleven-year-old boy, can you increase the level of exercise and then for some it may have had an additional advantage did they need to divide them up into those two categories i don't know if they really did i feel like as we will see when we move into the article the comparison between the two groups to me wasn't really significant Mm -hmm. it seemed like they they played up the obesity uh part of it but they never really measured anything related to it which we can talk about when they're right talk about results in the discussions later but for for me that kind of stood out i was like okay let's see how they're going to handle specifically the obesity issue but then it was about revolution per minute right yeah yeah yeah. and you know everyone started at their own pace which was good so there was some some differences in that which perhaps were related but it was you know just as in anything in behavior analysis it was all individually tailored which Mm -hmm. i think was a good thing their initial instructions were just exercise as long as you like they did a baseline for eight sessions and then like i said they determined the mean from that and then they in order to tie this into a reinforcement system they did a reinforcer survey they had several categories they basically just asked the participants to rate how much do you like these things on a scale from one to ten and based on what they said those (laughs) things that they said they liked more were (laughs) worth more points and i have to read out the list of things that they liked because i feel like they're worth mentioning so the reinforcers included a handheld battery operated game what what uh what do you think that was, Rob? Nineteen ninety two. I, I want to say that is an original Nintendo Game Boy. <laughs> is what I was uh, yeah, I would say Game Boy. It's an old brick shaped Game Boy. Or one uh-huh. of those Tiger Electronic ones where you don't have a Game Boy, but you get the one with like three buttons and it's just beep beep. It's LCD screen. Right. I had a couple of those with pinball and football. Yeah. Yeah. Still good. We still have the football one kicking around our house. We have baseball. Oh, it's baseball. It makes a terrible beep. It's the worst sound. Yeah. Okay, so they had that. Then they had a kite, a bicycle, Ooh. bell, a okay. flashlight, a model car, a model plane, a puzzle, an adventure book, and a comic book. So aside from the Game Boy, like the rest of these things sound like they're straight out of a 1950s. <laughs> you won them from your selling grit subscriptions. Yeah, right? <laughs> like a kite? I mean, I, and then I thought, I also thought it was kind of interesting that they, except for the kite, they're all sedentary activities. Mm-hmm. right like maybe they could the, ta- have... the times are changing I guess, <laughs> right i get. i don't know i would have taken that into consideration or maybe you could measure like it, you know interest in sedentary versus active reinforcers at the beginning of the study at the end of the study for like maybe some additional like social validity mm-hmm. there but they didn't do any uh, of that so anyway i just thought that besides the game boy like this list of items i wanted to mm-hmm. hear did everyone just pick the game boy the whole time <laughs> yeah. or what we don't know we didn't get that info after they established the baseline for each participant, they implemented the VR schedule, which was based on mean number of revolutions per minute, and their initial criterion to access the, the reinforcer was 15% increase over the mean responding. So, for example, if it was 60, 
they give you some math examples, which is always helpful, right? So if it was 60 oh, revolutions yeah. per minute, then the goal would be 70 revolutions per minute. And if it was 70 revolutions per minute, then it would be approximately 80 revolutions per minute. So that was kind of helpful. And then they told them, every time you hear the bell ring and the light go on, you're going to earn a point. And then at the end of the session, they told them how many points they had earned in the cumulative total to date. But what information I, I had a hard time figuring out here was when do they actually access the reinforcer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does anybody know? I just thought it was at the end. And again, I might be thinking of the like this the, the study article. went t- until summertime. Like did no, they No, but they would just get they they they'd go through it and they'd see how many they check the revolutions and then they were rewarded after that. Ah, yeah, maybe it wasn't in there. I don't know. I just sort of assumed it was a great job. You re- you rode your bike, you hit your goal. This now you get times. 5 minutes of game boy. Here's your, yeah, but it, here's I don't know, they don't time. specify. Cuz I could yeah, determine. It, it, just at the end they're told the bell each time the bell rang and they met the goal. They receive a point and then you accum- accumulate them. <laughs> That was it. Yeah. So yeah. sometime you get to trade in, but I don't I don't know exactly when. We will assume after yeah. they rode the bike. Mm-hmm. At some point in the near future. Yeah. Th- th- I feel like that's just one of those uh, situations you end up in as a result of having a brief report. Right? Those just those little details get lost and you never right. quite you yeah. never quite know. I'm sure you could write the authors and get more info. And they'd be like, I really it's been twenty years since I published <laughs> I don't this. Remember. I don't quite remember. <laughs> Actually, he's still saving his points. He hasn't yeah. Yet. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. All right. Uh, so they moved from that uh, initial first phase of the VR schedule. They moved everyone at the same time. So after, excuse me, at the 17th session, they moved them to the second phase where they increased the response requirement by 15% of their previous level. And then they did that again in the third phase. They again increased it by 15% as well. Uh, following that, they did a return to baseline where, again, there was no consequence. No points were earned for uh, riding the bike. They returned to the final VR subphase as the last level. And then it was time for summer vacation and everyone yeah. <laughs> went home and sat on the couch all day, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, no knows? way. They had a they had like a great, it was like a Lord of the Rings-esque epilogue at the end of this article. They did. No, they did. I yeah. loved it. That was my, favorite, us- my favorite part was the totally unresearchable... Uh, fun uplifting stories of all the all the participants some personal reflection all right so can i can i just make a, a point on the the dependent variable here yes please quick? yeah i think it would have been i mean the technology might not have been there in 1990 probably when they conducted this study but if we're looking at the actual magnitude of the revolutions um it would have been useful to maybe look at heart rate as well because mm-hmm. mm. you know we're looking at a revolution so like one cycle you know revolution per minute everybody's around between like 100 and 140 by the time they're done so they are like sitting on that bike and just like going to town so averaging over two bike pedal revolutions a minute that's like that's pretty fast that's fast it would be, yeah. yes it would be, you know if we're looking at exercise targets that you know as they're based on updated recommendations you know by today's standards it'll be important to see like what their heart rate was Mm -hmm. and if because that's you know that's the real kind of marker of of fitness here and if it was at a low uh, friction or resistance level i mean they could be spinning but there could be no actual cardio metabolic benefits here that's happening because i think we've all been on those bikes where you know there's no resistance and you could just spin (laughs) spin 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 spin, you know you're yeah. doing that, so you know, matching what what the actual physical benefits here are, and you know, they don't talk about the actual weight change, which is another piece of it. But um, I just wanted to, you know, it seems like maybe this dependent variable we don't know, but maybe we can speculate that it's it's an easy countable measure. But I don't know how how reflective it is if we're looking at this whole obesity um, health metric. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It said that the tension on the bike was moderately low, so that's probably yeah. not. I'm trying to think Not of 92, too much. 92, what they would have had. Because, I mean, I remember when I'd be in high school, you could go to gyms and you put your hands on the yes. the sensors and you could get your heart rate from that. And I don't know how good, right. how Those good a measure that was. Those were pretty new, though, was. when we were in high school. Yeah, but that was like late late 90s, early 2000s. So they might not have had anything. Or maybe you would do like the band around your chest yes. back then, that far back. and yeah. So that would that would be much easier to do nowadays. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. I'm, just, I'm just thinking, even if just... If I were to observe a kid that's on a bike and they're just pedaling their butt off, just spinning and spinning and spinning for like, you know, 15 minutes, they're like, man, they're, <laughs> they're really going to town right. there. 
<laughs> no, that's a good point. I mean, they could have included that as one of their changing criterion measures too, is mm-hmm. increasing the resistance on the bike, mm-hmm. not just the number of yeah rotations. All right. Yeah, because that's you know something with exercise and adaptation. Yeah. I mean, to go too nerdy here, but it's like you you know you're gonna adapt and be pretty good at walking two miles an hour then you need to step it up to three miles an hour for 10 minutes and four miles an hour for 10 minutes and yeah resistance would have been interesting and they didn't they didn't control for the actual duration of the session they you know because it was based on a hey i'm done criteria yeah right but for the most part they all participated in the full the full time when when the points were in yeah were in place yeah so let me think let me walk through these results with you guys here so they Gave everyone a pseudonym, obviously. And the boys who were not obese, they all gave names that started with the letter S. And then all the boys who were obese, they gave names that started with the letter P. Again, not sure how I feel about that portion. Um, nice catch. I didn't notice that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they could have... They, they refrained from giving everyone the letter like F. So I guess that's <laughs> something, but I don't know. Uh, like I said b- before, I don't really know that that distinction is useful when we're talking about these data, uh, with the exception that the boys uh, in the latter category did start with a lower baseline rate, and so the criterion uh, for them to meet reinforcement was a little bit lower as time went on. Uh, Overall, the results follow the same pattern in that baseline was uh, steady or tapered off as baseline continued and was relatively low uh, for all six boys. Averaging around 70 rotation, what are they called? Revolutions? Revolutions. I'm going to get it soon. Revolutions per minute. The article's uh, almost over, so you better do it. <laughs> I know, right. Uh, for the boys whose name started with S, and around 50 uh, revolutions per minute for the boys whose name started with P. Uh, from there, everyone uh, increased responding when the reinforcement system was put into place. For most participants, uh, responding did adhere to the criterion relatively well as that criterion was increased. Uh, if they had wanted to you know, really look at establishing control, they could have included a, a decrease in their criterion as well because th- we have just an increase in criterion across all the three subphases. Uh, but like I said, it did adhere relatively well. When they went back to baseline, oh yeah, everybody dropped way down. <laughs> they And mm-hmm. apparently verbally stated... Why are we not earning points anymore? I really want to earn points. <laughs> Which to me says that they must have been contacting the reinforcer, I would think, yeah. all along. Well, they're getting all those points. Right? They, they, they were trading right. them for something. Yeah, Whether so they, they couldn't s- have just still been earning points. Right. We wouldn't have seen rein- or behavior continue. Uh, uh, and then they, me- yeah, they mentioned in the, uh, in the discussion that the, that the bike bell and the light no longer signaled points. So, I mean, if these are you know, highly right. verbal kids, you're like, okay, now you're not going to earn points, so hop on the bike and the bell's not going to go on. And <laughs> Yes, and they're like, oh, it's no. It's pretty much like, <laughs> everything's, we're not going to be lying to you, everything will be true, and so that was... Kind of yeah, they didn't even need to contact the contingency, they just learned it, you know, right away, so... Yeah. Uh, and then they returned, to, after that baseline where rates were d- drastically lower, almost back to previous baseline levels, although not quite... They went back to the third VR subphase, which was the highest rates, and responding again, uh, actually went above and beyond the criterion level for five out of the six mm-hmm. participants, which was pretty pretty good to see. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you bring up a good point, Nick. It's likely that this resistance at this point, after they had done all this practice, was, was easier than it was previously, yeah. Uh, yeah. too. So it would be not unexpected to see the rates be even higher. And then Perry was the participant for whom he had a more difficult time all along the way of meeting the criterion. And another thing to note is that he was absent a lot. So that certainly could have played in to this. Or there could have been other factors, really other confounds there as to why he was absent that could have played into his success with this. At the end, I was really impressed with how the boys all went on to win Olympic medals and... and (laughs) You know, they, they felt better about themselves. They asked out that girl. They were thinking about the, the prom, and one of them yeah. became president. I think was right. All because it was, it was quite. I was just gonna yeah. say my favorite part was where uh, all the boys whose name started with P they uh, asked their parents to purchase them a new bike. Yeah, and they all got a new bike. So I found that heartwarming. And they all became yeah. shot putters. I think two of them. 
the two of them became shot putters. No, they want they were in relays. Okay, relays. I just I Sean and Steve. It did seem the pattern was the obese boys did. They did some of the the jumping events, but that the the non obese boys went into the longer running, and then the obese boys went into some of the other events. But I guess yeah. that might make sense because maybe they're less obese now and just more stocky. Well, they didn't practice running. If they had had bicycling events. <laughs> Was, right, that's, they probably would have been more prepared. That's the point I was thinking. It's like, well, so you're <laughs> saying cycling on a bike for 15 minutes is going to translate to track and field success? It seems right. kind of a seems like a little bit of a leap there. No pun intended. Right, yeah. <laughs> good one. But even even the way the article kind of ended, it was kind of very anecdotal and kind of story like, kind of heartwarming, fuzzy. Where it seemed like the beginning of the article and the end of the article, the way it was kind of written, it was like, oh, okay, all about the obesity. But in the middle, mm-hmm. it was all about the cycling. And so it, maybe it seemed like they were just trying to show that maybe separating into obese and non-obese uh, kind of groups, you could show that, hey, we could get obese children to move too, which I kind of see that point. But right. um, but then the only evidence they, they showed about the actual obesity, because obesity is just a category of how much you weigh yeah. relative yeah. to your height. And so it would have been more valuable had they collected just – had the kid get on a, on the scale at the beginning at the end and see if any weight changed because the only evidence they provide is anecdotal in which they say Peter's uh, can wear his stepfather's pants, which are a size 32 instead of a size 36. I'm like, right. come on, we can take better data than this. <laughs> you know, it's like if we're going to talk about obesity as much as they did, yeah. then we need to, we need to have some obesity metrics and it just wasn't there. Agreed. That's a good point. Uh, I, maybe I would have preferred the categorizations to have been like currently active versus inactive and, and mm-hmm. had more data on what were their regular exercise mm-hmm. patterns yeah. because a um, sedentary child who's not obese could be obese soon, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that to me is more important to be measuring yeah. perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't mind me going on a tangent here, yeah. I, was, I was in a, uh, another art, uh, was another reading group with uh, non-behavior analyst researchers, and it was a study about, um, it was like a two-year study, and it looked at um, a group of obese uh, patients, and or actually like severely over, or, yeah, I think they're obese or morbidly obese, and so like over two-year time, they compared two group studies, and um, that both groups, they each lost 15 pounds, and one was slightly better than the other, and so like, you know, I'm thinking clinically here, and I'm speaking to an audience of clinicians of like, okay, you spent two years in a project and you only lost 15 pounds and nobody's categories changed. I'm like, that is a, that's a problem. Like we're celebrating differences in groups and things, but like, no, these people came in weighing on average 285 pounds and then they mm. left weighing an average of 275 pounds. And like, I'm, I'm sure if you, if you give them to one personal trainer and, you know, force them to eat a healthy diet for a month, they would have lost 10 pounds in you know, a couple months, you know? Yeah. So it's, there's there's that huge gap I think obviously in research and practice but you know, it's important to I think to look at those those clinically significant outcomes. Yeah, that's just what I was about to say too is it's not about, you know, statistically significant change, it's mm-hmm. socially significant change. So mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. Now, Mike, I had a kind of a logistical question and I think we brought up some some real limitations with how great is it that the kids can now get more revolutions per minute, you know, what what is that what does that really mean? But mm, in yeah. terms of just, you know, l- let's just assume, well, if these kids weren't moving as much and now they are moving more, that's probably, I mean, that's in the right direction, whether or not it's a significant real life change. Something like the setup they had in this where, where there was that kind of gamification of the bells and the, and the mm-hmm. light on, is, there, is that some sort of commercially available add-on that you could do to your bike or your treadmill because i just i read that and i say oh man i would love to have something like that because you know I, I if i run i go outside now um but when the winter <laughs> coming i don't i don't want to go outside when it's going to be freezing cold and i know that's going to you know change the response effort to running two miles is now going to be significantly higher but running on treadmill is super boring because it's not nice outside it's not, well, not not as much fun yeah. inside is there something that would you know give me some of that you know ringing oh, bells yeah. and all that jazz Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, even better. I um, are you guys familiar with the Tour de France? Yeah. And the the terminology, the peloton. No, that, no, which not is, that. Which, which is well, the the peloton is like the name of like the the big group of riders that are all kind of in the lead. I think if there's cyclists out there, feel free to correct me. But then there's actually <laughs> so there's a branded like stationary cycle called the peloton, 
which is um, it's an upright bike, but it has a whole video screen on it, and you like compete against people, and it has all the bells and whistles in it. And it has a, oh, wow. it's like a it's like a simulated Tour de France, like in your living room. Oh, and that's so, that's cool. So, it, I mean, I imagine that would have all the gamification because it has video and simulation and you can um, you can stream live and you can do other workouts I've seen on on bikes, too, that like it's a um, everybody who is on this biking cycling program all um, will take like a live spinning class together, um, huh. like virtually just like everybody like you take, a, you know, we're all talking to each other now or you can meet online through video like video conferencing but you're on a bike and you're competing against them so i think i think that might capture your bells and whistles game oh, cool. yay i might yeah. have heard about this actually now that you're like elaborating yeah. on it and, mm-hmm. and i hear the word that you're saying which is like a fresh I, i've seen i've word. seen some treadmills too that have like videos and simulations that you know you can pretend that you're like walking or running up hills and you're with a trainer that's like in front of you and it's all like a video and everything so yeah. Technology is getting super sophisticated, way past a red seven watt light right. bulb. <laughs> <laughs> that allows good. you to train it in for a yo yo and a <laughs> and jacks. <laughs> yeah. Great job. Have this Game Boy from 1992. <laughs> you play Tetris. That game's great. You are you, like are you thinking about doing like a pure replication all the way down to the reinforcers? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> really Probably become very costly to have to find some of these old reinforcers. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else to say about our revolutions per minute and our cycling? Uh, I think the takeaway here is that this reinforcement system worked well for these preteen boys, regardless of their current weight. Uh, however, uh, removal of the reinforcement system produced pretty significant decreases in the behavior. Nick, is that pattern true? Because I, when I always think of exercise, I've always sort of said, "Oh, but at some point you'll get the runners high, or you'll get, you'll have those those physical changes that just make the act of exercising so enjoyable." But in reality, is is that similar in other <laughs> research that like we got these pro runners and we got them to run even more, and then we took away the reinforcement, and the pro runners were like, "We don't want to do this anymore." Boo. Oh, right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, it's the, the runner's high is subjective. We can't really measure it, so it's always hard to say. But, you know, I think if we have a few environmental events in front of us that we can look at, such as you know, coaching and number of people in a running group and, you know, medals at the end of the checkered, you know, line and everything, like uh, even yeah. those adventure races and multiple, like, you know, 5Ks, like, you know, you have all the reinforcers of, if you complete like three certain types of races, then you can put them all together and then you make like a super medal and all those fun things. So, you know, I think I, just like you guys are probably lean towards, you know, measuring those things for runner's eye. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone or like likes the group rewards. accountability, little challenges on Fitbit mm. things like that. Well, I know, I know if I'm, if I'm like running anywhere and I see someone, walking around the block i'll say to myself i feel like they're walking faster than i'm running and i'll try to run faster <laughs> just i'll te- i'll show them that's funny <laughs> yeah that accountability piece you don't even know they're losing i know <laughs> it's not fun if you can't tell them <laughs> i'm slightly faster running than you are walking suck it yeah Okay, well, before we move on to our next article, uh, for those of you who are new listeners, ABA Inside Track is uh, ACE approved for continuing education, and this episode is no exception. Even you know we've got special guests, and, and you even get CEs for listening to that. How exciting! So you will have to listen to the whole thing, and you will have to apply on our website, abainsidetrack.com, with two secret code words that you'll only know if you listen to the episode, because we're not going to tell them to you if you just email us and ask for them. And the first secret code word is amble a m b l e i like to amble from place to place because running is much too hard but as long as i'm not sitting i'm probably doing okay <laughs> i like the moving. i like the i like the physical activity themed uh, <laughs> word password i like it i can't wait to see what, hear what the what the second code word is that's um, right it's, it's usually either themed to the episode or i if i watch something from the simpsons i'll i'll just like, quote some simpsons thing so that's the that's the pattern <laughs> if someone wants to oh, the, code. <laughs> the, the secret has been okay <laughs> that's funny it's 30 years worth of simpsons to choose from though so you know it's, it's not that easy all right so i guess it's time to move on to our second article step it up which that's how that is how it is written and that is how we will have to pronounce it 
Uh, written by written by Channing Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> this is the good behavior game to increase physical activity with elementary school students at recess. So uh, for if you've listened to a couple of episodes, we did a whole one on the good behavior game, which is, again, usually if you see it in research, it's about decreasing disruption in the classroom. Uh, so typically you have your, you know, it's a group contingency where you have, you know, two teams, three teams, some, some number of teams. And there are set rules. So if you engage in behavior X, you call out, you leave your desk, you get a hatch mark on the board. And at the end of the period in which the game is being played, if you have less than the number, then your team wins. And multiple teams can win or only one team can win. And the prizes are typically pretty straightforward. They're not as much fun as battery-operated electronic game. They're usually stickers or uh, you get headphones. or you Seasonal get to, pencils. Yeah, seasonal pencils come up a lot. I guess based on one article, Young uh, Young and All from 2005, in which there was a good behavior game in which one of the targets was physical activities for sixth graders, uh, our researchers decided, hey, I wonder if we could use a modified version of the good behavior game to increase physical activity as a very specific goal. Because this old article, it hadn't been their main goal. They were looking at waiting off task and motor activity, which I didn't go back and find the 2005 study, but those seem like three very odd choices for targets but they'd been very subjective and so they decided so, so our current researchers galbraith and norman said let's just look at the physical activity and and much like we talked about with our bikes and how technology has changed instead of just sort of doing subjective physical movements they actually got pedometers and put them on all the kids at recess so that they could actually track their total number of movements approximate because pedometers pro approximate, man approximate. like old school pedometers or like Fitbit wristband thing. These are hold no no no. I, I wrote down the name because it's very okay, thank very you. fancy. It is the they use the Yamax SW two hundred DigiWalker pedometers, which they mentioned has been validated for use in research with children. Okay. So this is the real deal pedometer. So it's not kids just shaking their foot. I mean, I guess they could probably trick the pedometers. You know, no matter what how good your pedometer is, there's going to be some way to sort of futz with it it's not not an exact science i guess no these are verified so i believe it but they're verified for use in research and there was an ex there was a researcher out there the whole time at at research at research at research at recess <laughs> at research time <laughs> okay <laughs> so in this case we have our good behavior game and the goal here was taking 20 students from a third grade classroom and they were just looking at the number of steps uh, for each class during the recess period. And they'd get the number of steps from their Yamax SW200 DigiWalker pedometer. And then they would uh, divide the mean step counts by the duration of recess. Because if any of you have been to recess, it is not always the exact same amount of time. It was anywhere from 12 minutes to about, you know, about actually about 13 minutes to about 16 and a half minutes. So they're looking at mean step counts. So you'd have your two teams. So they pretty much just uh, describe the pedometers to the students. They let them use them for about a week before they started. And then they just randomly said, you're in team A, kids, and you're in team B. And they left it the same throughout the study. though. So through baseline and through the use of the good behavior game. And in baseline, they just went to recess. The kids ran around. They had their pedometers on. They got their mean steps. And that was all. Nothing special happened. Then when they implemented the good behavior game, ah, oh, well, then they got belts to signify what team they were on. They explained the rules before the first day of playing. And they just pretty much just said, everyone, if your team takes the most steps, you win a raffle ticket. And the experimenter just stood outside at recess, and they had a motivator in their own pocket to signal them every, you know, variable time, three-minute schedule, just to prompt the use of rules. Don't forget, the team who moves the most will be the winner. So this was really their biggest modification, because as they mentioned, the good behavior game, you're typically are going and finding someone who's not following the rules and you say, you know, Billy on team B is not, in this case, is not moving anywhere. But mm -hmm. rather than do that, you know, find that kid who's, you know, sitting down on a bench and go over and say, oh, you're not moving. They just sort of decided, well, we'll just do this arbitrary rule reminder statement at these, these variable time schedule. So that was the Seems big pretty difference. different from the regular good behavior and that's, game. And that's kind of my big point is this really almost doesn't feel like they're using the good behavior game. They're just using a group contingency. I wasn't quite sure why this would fall into the category of it's good hot. behavior game. Hot topic. Because you just call it that? Because you call any group contingency in which there's winners and losers good behavior game? Because that's not 
group contingencies have been around forever. So we, we can come back to that. Okay. But that that was really my big eyebrow raising moment with this whole study is why is why is this the good behavior game? It just seems like just any other group contingency. But in any case, the experimenter was really, really fast at doing their calculations because the second recess was over. They had to calculate average step counts for all the kids so that they could decide which team had the most steps, which meant that they were the winners. They'd get a badge. And then later that day, they'd trade in the badge for lottery tickets. And then later on, they have a lottery in which they could win stickers, snap bracelets, crayons, and coloring pages. And unlike normal good behavior game protocols, the only way both teams could win is if the step counts were within 50 steps of each other. Hmm. Which, again, that sounds very... I'm not sure why they chose 50 steps. I don't, I don't think they mentioned it. So it seemed like it would be very hard for both teams to... Potentially hard for, for both teams to win. Unlike the regular good behavior game where you hope it is easy for everybody to win. And, and usually through the repetitions, most of the teams start to win you know, all of the time. That's why it's such a good, good treatment. I got. A, I have a technical question with this. I'm not as familiar with the good behavior game. Maybe you already answered it. But if you have two teams that are competing and it's a both, it's both an interdependent group contingency. Is it still technically an inter interdependent group contingency? Because there's not like, it's not a goal that they're all trying to reach. It's like it's beating the other person. So is it really the group contingency? Because they're not like working on something together. Well, their scores are together. So I guess if you had to categorize a good behavior game, it would probably fall closest to that, yeah, to the, okay. to the inter to the interdependent. So everyone wins or loses together. Yep, everyone has because okay. everyone has to reach the goal, which is get out okay. of your seat less than five times, gotcha. or three times. Okay, so maybe here here it could be like the separate point. So with their measure here with the steps, the pedometers are closed and they can't they don't have feedback. And a typical classroom setting don't. Don't the students typically have like feedback with like points on the board or something so they yeah, know where they see it. Yeah. where they lie? Okay, I think that's that's the thing that I'm hung up on. But, but even yeah, they, they don't know until their, the end. Yeah, but even if they could look at their pedometers later on, yeah. you know, we're getting into the results. But you look at the ratios of the steps, and you see that there mm -hmm. were a couple kids that really tanked their pedometers. Like they did way worse. Way well, I, I don't want to say way worse, but they walked. Uh, they moved way less when the good behavior game was in effect than when it wasn't in effect. So you'd have to be comparing your pedometer to other kids and trying to figure out like, oh, what's yeah. yours? What's yours? And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you could meaningfully actually get good feedback from your pedometer. I mean, I guess you would see like I ran yeah. this many steps and that seems good and figured out after a couple of days. But I mean, these are little kids. I don't know if they were right. able to, to track their own well, steps. That I mean, way. we're, we're talking about the Yamax, but I, I mean, <laughs> if there's a will, there's a way with, if you had technology, if you could have, all your Fitbits funnel into a digital scoreboard and you could see all the yeah. steps funnel up in real time. I think that would be, I mean, that would be like a, a technological upgrade. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, that makes me, now, now you're making me think of those like yacker trackers that they put in some school cafeterias where you've got like the green, yellow, red, and depending how many oh, decibels okay. it is, it starts going up. So some sort of board like that where it's like, oh, oh looks like, like. Well, it would be like the scream counter in Monsters, Inc. Yeah. That's what it would be. Yeah, like for scream steps. counter in Monsters, that, Yeah. Right. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Of. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, so I didn't mean to digress oh, there. No, this, no, no, no. That's, that's, when you, that's a very when good you, point. When you yeah. get into it, just like, well, is it technically then a group, you know, that same, is it apples to apples or apples to oranges here? If, you know, I, if, if it seems like from what I know about the good behavior game, like get, getting feedback is, a, is such a key component of the group contingency. Because, well, the kids have to be able to tell each other, hey, I mean, well, and, and it's it's not, I don't think the, I think the jury's still out as to why the good behavior game works compared to some of the other group contingencies or doesn't work as well yeah. or works better. Okay. But it, I think the underlying thought is there is some component of, social pressure of hey you are failing our team and you get that feedback so you can re respond to each other mm -hmm. whereas in this yeah. the kids have no clue i mean i guess if they saw a kid who was just sitting on their duff you know yeah. eating, right. a, eating an apple or something when they're supposed to be up right. and running around you might be like come on let's play let's play let's move around but, because then you know maybe he's this would be fine grain you have a minimum criteria for it to be an interdependent group contingency like everybody needs to move at least 500 steps if not then you even if you're even if your team team beats the other team not everybody was moving, so then, you know, you could be intermittently reinforcing the people sitting down. Yeah, and, yes. and that's sort of what it came down to is because some of the kids seemed like they really did not move very much. You know, and so, I, I mean, I get why they didn't do the, hey, kid, you're sedentary, you get a hatch mark, because every, you know, no child 
moves constantly as much as i'm sure those of us who, who work in public schools might think that children just never stop moving every kid right. you know, they run in they play, they play football and then they sit and they talk to a friend for 30 seconds or a minute or so and technically they're yeah. not really moving so they would get the hatch mark so you couldn't really use that as the as the the rule the yep. rule for the kids because you, you they'd all be failing really fast even though they're moving so it wouldn't have been yeah. effective i don't think Good it would point. have been very effective in that regard yeah. So let's see. So where were we? Oh, they also did social validity. Um, hey, and they had a bunch of statements. Did the Step It Up game increased physical activities on a Likert scale of one to five? The intervention seemed simple to implement. I would want to try implementing this game in the future. And I thought they asked everybody, but then when I read it again, I think they only asked the classroom teacher her thoughts on the on the whole process. Is all she right. the one having to add up all those pedometers? No, that was the experiment. <laughs> I don't know how, because that's 20 kids. You're averaging all those all those numbers together. Well, they just that give fast. you all the pedometers and you, you know, use a calculator. Every, a calculation's that fast. No matter how much it seems like you're just adding and then dividing by 10, it always seems like it should be. It, it seems math is hard. doing it fast. Like it's going to take a while, but hey, it's hard, the yeah. kids were patient. Dividing by 10, I know. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, divide by 10. Maybe that's why they picked 20 kids. <laughs> I, I imagine they had like a spre- an Excel spreadsheet open, so they just yeah. punch in the data. There you yeah, go. there it is. When you look at the results, so we've got kind of, uh, you know, sessions and over uh, sessions by mean step counts per minute. You What you saw combined results, uh, the kids were going about 78 steps per minute during baseline, and that jumped up to 89 when the good behavior game was in play. Team one, I don't want to call them the big losers, but they pretty much lost almost all the time. They went from 81 steps per minute in baseline to 85 during good behavior game, whereas team two was 74 steps per minute to 94 steps per minute during the good behavior game. Yeah, team two had no overlapping data points between the GBG and the baseline. Yeah, their graph looks great. You've got their their, their good behavior game. It's just a, a line above their baseline, whereas team one, it was, it was up and down. Sometimes their baseline was better. So not quite as good. The combined results look, look a lot more like the team two results. Now, the ratio of steps, we sort of already mentioned that, but you have... When you look at that graph, you've got your, your ratio to steps. So you've got one in the middle. So you've got your bar graphs. And if the bar is up, it means that the ratio of steps in good behavior game was higher than to their steps in the baseline and vice versa. So you want the bar graphs to be going up. And, man, team one, their their ratios were pretty small. Except for that, there's one kid whose ratio was almost twice as much. And that kid yeah, must he, have been he carried the team feeling real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Because two kids were almost down to you know negative point five in terms of their their lack. Yeah, of and movement. if these were like seventh graders, I could sort of see that, like not wanting to participate. Although they mm-hmm. have successfully run the good behavior game, the traditional one, with all age groups up through high school. Yeah, but I could sort of see like seventh graders trying to stick it to the man and being like, "I'm not going to do your oh, these are third dumb graders. pedometer game." But, but yeah, these are third graders, so they should be all for it. Yeah, because I don't know those two. Maybe there was some serious drama that they need to talk about. Maybe. Yeah. And then team two, you sort of had a, a, a dissimilar pattern where all, all the kids were doing pretty well at that ratio, except one kid on team two who had by far the worst ratio. Yeah. So th- when I when I see that ratio, and they didn't really spend a lot of time talking about that ratio, it really doesn't feel like what you would expect to see in the good behavior game, where you see almost all the kids continuing to improve in engaging, in not engaging in the target behavior. Because you had some kids here who really actually performed worse under the good behavior game contingency in terms of their mean steps per per minute. So I, I don't know that 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 doesn't that doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't quite jive with what I've what I've read about good behavior game in terms of you got some kids who really their movement didn't change it. Their movement got worse. They they walked less. Was it because they saw the other kids running around more and they thought, eh, I'll sit for a while? Was it? I think it would just reflect that they're wasn't a lot of uh, control or present across these two conditions yeah. yeah i would also want to know more i think about whether the reinforcers like the backup reinforcers were functional at all or if that part even needed to be included in the study i mean overall the results were, were good yes yes um well they did mention that the the lottery ticket system was one that already existed so okay. they really did not control for the reinforcement of or putative reinforcement of those lottery tickets, the kids could earn them at other times. So potentially, you could not ever be on team one, never ever win the good behavior game for your physical movement, 
and then go inside and you personally and, and it didn't really describe what you got the but i don't think it described what you could get the lottery tickets for go inside and then do all your homework and answer all the questions and get a bazillion lottery Re- tickets. really good point so it's not a closed economy no not at all i wonder if I, I would have been interested to see if they had a different condition where it was just compete right step it up yeah. compete red team versus blue team and see who wins and without the lottery and the stickers and the p- pencils or whatever mm. oh, it was, yeah. you know because yeah. sometimes that might be more fun and reinforcing hmm? yeah or just, just hard playing, playing a game <laughs> against each other yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Just the competition aspect yeah the, the reinforcers would be more immediate and uh deliverable you know if you're playing tag against each other or whatever you're playing tunnel tag as a team you know you're the, the the reinforcers delivered. The person has to freeze right there or something like that. <laughs> yeah, good you know, point. You, um, but I think I think the results are encouraging because you have 16 out of 20 students in the good behavior game. They uh, all increased activity, which mm-hmm. was the whole point of the study. And I think it just lends itself to uh, you know there's individual variability, and so maybe mm-hmm. those four individuals that decre- had decreased steps have different you know there's different motivation for them or uh, yeah, the reinforcers were ineffective. Participant 19 there in the end maybe had a bum ankle for, you know, two right? weeks. And, no, you know, nobody nobody said, hey. It's okay if you were, this nobody, one out. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, I, I would think they would have mentioned happen. that because they did talk about the one recess where the kids got like 30 minutes of recess. And we didn't use that data oh, point because yeah. they got right. – so I would think one participant was injured yeah. would have rated. Plus their, it was an alternate report, treatment, but, so then that should yes. be reflective. I wonder if kids move move around more on the playground – if it's hot outside or cold outside young children don't feel cold they're just, <laughs> they're just mm-hmm. excited to be outside because i move less when it's cold but i feel like you should move more because it warms you up yeah or you or it could be the opposite if it gets too hot like i live in florida right mm-hmm. that will make you not want to move and so you wait till it gets cooler <laughs> right see we're in massachusetts it's already cold up here right but they still in most places still send the kids out you know it's not below for you just keep or actually if, if the if the wind chill is not significantly below zero do you go outside mm-hmm. it depends it uh, maybe public school that's the rule like the daycare it's they let the little kids go out even if it's cold mm. it's like a swedish system or something they just go outside <laughs> oh the great swedish <laughs> you'll get used to it just go system. just go yes, play yes, yeah yeah they just keep them going out which i think is good yeah it's you live in new england you might yeah, as well get little... get used to the cold are you talking about where they uh, have them like go outside in their uh like bathing suits for like 10 minutes to play and then come back inside no they wear real clothes but they <laughs> <laughs> they don't make them nap outside like or anything polar, like that the polar bear it's not challenge that for the little kids yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. okay maybe i'm thinking about something else yeah the polar bear. <laughs> babies in some nordic countries they nap outside and they feel that that's good for your i don't know constitution i think <laughs> yeah, yeah they put them outside in all all weather we don't okay. do that in new england no but not quite but they do send him out to play in the cold. There's some there's some story that I saw. I think it was like like everybody goes outside and plays for like five minutes. It's like the the reintroduction of like cold and heat, like ice bath going into the sauna. Like it changes like I don't know, something in your blood and physiology where it like releases certain hormones are related to like mm-hmm. growth and adolescence and puberty and that stuff. That it's like good for health and immunity to be have your system stressed and shocked like that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I feel like the, yeah. there was a. The, the cold shower capper like you're supposed to take a hot shower mm-hmm. and then turn it as cold as possible right before you're done and for as long as you can withstand yeah. it and i i assume that's something to do with that kind of the same oh well I think it's supposed to close does your something pores. with your oh i don't know i thought it's something to do with your immune system like it I kicks know, your immune system yeah. into I, yeah i think it's tied <laughs> to like like some type of outcome um again for the listeners like i don't don't quote me on any of this but it's like oh, yeah. when you when you shock the immune system that like these kids in, in this European country that did this, they had fewer like infections and colds and everything because basically it was strengthening their immune system by being exposed to the elements and and, and stressful environmental events. Yeah, but that that was like the general idea. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, 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 yeah. more reasonable than what whatever is the example of because it was good juju or something you were saying. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean that yeah. that wasn't so scientific. Good, good for their constitution. That's what you said. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, good behavior game is has some effect on increasing physical activity. I'd like to know a little bit more about the the why it's working and, and how you can improve it, or maybe with some seeing your score on the board, see how that affects. But 
it's a good a good start a good start to I one, think it's a one good question tool. to be asking yeah definitely. and there's a lot of different ways we could ask it before we go into our last segment why don't we take a short little break stand up because we've been talking for a little while walk around and come right back ABA Inside Trackers, it's me, Jackie. And it's me, Diana. Jackie, I am really excited to be joining you in this commercial because I've also started my career path at Regis. Yay! Yes, that's right, folks. If you want to start an exciting career in applied behavior analysis, you should check out the Master's and Certificate Program in Applied Behavior Analysis at Regis College. You can learn from both Diana and me. Here are some interesting facts about our program. 90% of our 2016 graduates passed the BCBA exam during their first time taking the exam. We think this is a really great testament to the program. We started an on-campus autism center in fall 2017. The center provides behavior analytic services to children diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder right at Regis College. The center will offer employment opportunities for some of our graduate students. Students working at the center will receive partial tuition remission. We also offer opportunities for paid clinical placements and graduate assistantships starting in the student's first year. So all of our grad students are currently working in the field, either part-time or full-time. Yes, we help students identify their practicum placements because we think it's imperative students receive excellent training and experience in the application of behavior analysis. Therefore, we screen placements to ensure students receive high-quality practicum placements. We are approved by the BACB to provide intensive practicum. Students complete at least 750 hours, but most complete much more over the course of three semesters. Across that time, students complete a professional portfolio that includes completing a variety of application exercises, such as conducting assessments, developing behavior plans, training curriculum, and more. This portfolio functions as a way to ensure students are learning the essentials of being an effective behavior analyst and is a great way to showcase your work at job interviews upon graduation. I love it. Students enroll in two courses per semester and graduate in a little under two years. Our courses are offered in traditional classroom and hybrid formats, which enables a student to focus on one course at a time while still completing the program quickly. All of the faculty are PhD level BCBAs with strong applied and research backgrounds in ABA and all have published papers in respected peer reviewed journals. We ensure small class sizes so that all students receive personalized attention from their professors and advisors are easily accessible to meet with students. There is also an invited lecture series at Regis, which involves inviting outside experts in ABA to speak on specialized topics relating to practicing ABA. And these are really great opportunities for students to learn from a variety of experts in the field in addition to their professors. And last summer we completed an international service trip to Iceland, which we plan to do every other year. Although we train students to work effectively with individuals diagnosed with autism, we also have opportunities for students to work with individuals with a variety of diagnoses and typically developing individuals as well. In addition, the coursework covers the broad applications of ABA with respect to solving socially important problems. There are opportunities for students to be involved in faculty research as well. We have a great location. We're just 12 miles from the center of Boston. So check us out at www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Keep responding. All right, we are back. And we had a nice little break. We got up, moved around a little bit, and... This time, since we don't have Jackie to do our dissemination station sound effect, and since we have Nick to talk about some of the work he's doing, I figured we kind of just combine the two into a little semi-dissemination station and have Nick tell us a little bit more about the work he's doing related to fitness and behavior change. So, Nick, what what have you been working on in the, in the past many, sure, many months, yeah. I guess? Yeah, the past month. I can kind of give a little review, a pre- or yeah, a review of... Uh previous episodes i can 
fall 2015, I was able to get my master's th thesis published, which was about reducing sitting in the workplace. And it's uh, in Java titled Decreasing Bouts of Prolonged Sitting among, among Office Workers. So again, I'm able to kind of combine my interest of OBM and health in the workplace together. So um, again, like we discussed earlier, sitting is uh, bad for us, especially when we accumulate the, the, uh, the amount of sedentary behavior in long about so the average duration we might sit so we might average sitting down for 45 minutes at a time or 15 minutes at a time um, things like that so that total duration kind of affects us and um, in the modern workplace we have computer-based work and a lot of people that work on computers so it's it's important to get those people moving so that's kind of what my first study was about and um, I, since then i followed it up with a few studies looking at various manipulations of feedback and task clarification and looking how to shape physical activity um, in the workplace. Awesome. Right. Do you want to tell us about those? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you guys had any specific questions about what I said so far. Well, you're talking about fitness fitness in the workplace, you said? Uh, just general like health and activity um, um, in the workplace because it's important to kind of move regularly throughout your workday. So we, we're kind of stuck, you know, I say stuck with, but the, the best saying so far um, about sedentary behaviors to sit less, reduce your total time, and to move more. So kind of break up that sedentary pattern every 30 to 40 minutes. And that's kind of what my research is focused on. So I'll, I'll, I'll measure um, an individual's activity levels with, uh, with a Fitbit. And so I can break up um, their, their day into like 30-minute bins and see how, how many steps somebody took throughout their work shift. And I look at those data, and then I give them feedback based on like, hey, you've you had um, six bouts of uh, activity today. Let's get it up to seven bouts. And so I've looked at how um, being specific about like how many steps. And so I have a, a, a manuscript right now that's been submitted to the Java actually. So if we have any editors in the audience, feel free to <laughs> hit hit a hit approve. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's just really uh, looking at you know how consequences you know in the workplace with healthy healthy behavior change impact. Um, and help people move more versus um, focusing so much on the antecedents in which I, which are, what's what I've kind of found that a lot of public health campaigns and things like that, there's a lot of uh, um, heavy on the, hey, if we just set up, uh, give everybody standing desks and um, give everybody reminders and teach them, tell them how bad smoking is and teach them how bad sitting is and they'll, they'll get up and move. And it's like, well, that doesn't really work for everybody. But <laughs> right. if, you, if you give people some feedback and tell them, you know, in a group of people that are interested in moving, tell them how they're doing, like they, they tend to get up and move more. And so with my, 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 yeah, with my data that's in submission, I've been able to, you know, have some, some decent results. And so, um, yeah, it's been very, very exciting to see. And I've learned a lot, um, along the way. So, so where, where I work, the printer is nowhere near my desk. I have to good. go upstairs to the other good. end of the building. <laughs> yeah. The environment. Right. All right. To yeah. use the printer and the same is true for the water fountain it's upstairs the mm -hmm. other end of the building right so initially yeah. i was like this is super annoying but now i think that it's a good thing it is a good thing yeah it's yeah. uh kind of some pet peeves rule of thumbs that i kind of have is like don't don't have your office supplied with everything like your your desk that you work at don't have like uh you know reams of paper and post-its and all the pencils you need like no just have one of everything and then when you need something go to the supply room and go get it. Yeah, if I want so to get new can... materials, I have to go to a whole different building, which is up a yeah. hill. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's not terribly efficient, but it right. is good for, well, for you just have getting to up and retrain moving. yourself to say like, hey, this is actually beneficial for myself. And so right. when you start seeing just the basic things like that, like those opportunities, and then you can start transferring those those ideas into like other opportunities. Like today, driving back from Miami, you know, we're taking a coffee break, and there's a hundred chairs to sit down at, but there's like four standing bar high tables. And it's like, well, I've been sitting for an hour. So let me take right. the opportunity to stand and drink my coffee for 15 minutes before I go sit for another hour. So, yeah. you know, once you, once you get in the habit and routine of doing something real basic in the office, it'll quickly, you know, if you like what you're doing, you know, if you like the effects that you're mm -hmm. engaging in, you know, you'll, I think they'll translate well to other areas. Yeah. I know Nick, the last time, or I think it was your original study when you were looking at the workplace. I know one of the 
the conflicts that that came that came into it is that sometimes your participants would get in trouble because they were getting up and oh. moving. Oh, yeah. Have you found that to still be the case, or are or, or, or workplaces a little more sensitive to? Oh God, everyone's sitting too much, and that's really bad. So yeah, I must have previewed that, but I'll, I'll go over it again. So at, at the time, this was the the second project I had going on where um, the work contingencies, so you know, the support from management, you know, can tend to override any type of little feedback a researcher may give sure, a yeah. uh, participant on their activity. And that's, yeah, that's the real world. That's what, that's what we're working with. And so the contingency was that was just the natural one in the workplace, which is actually very punishing is that if you're just away from your desk, you, you had the opportunity to just get written up because you need to be working there diligently, kind of like a worker bee. And mm -hmm. um, I had a participant that um, was just going to get a drink of water unrelated to my study and she got written up for oh, being no. in well, yeah, for her just being away from her desk. And, you know, she told me, you know, anecdotally on the side that she's like, and, you know, I looked at my productivity metrics and I was like above where I needed to be. So it was just a very aversive environment. And unfortunately, there are those that people oh. work in that those are going to those are going to overrule any, you know, any type of initiative you might be, you know, you might have going on. But um, you got those issues. But then you also have other work responsibilities like um, one participant is a receptionist and can't physically leave her environment because she needs to be warm and welcoming to walk-ins and things right. like that. So mm. having a prescriptive, hey, everybody sit less, move more, that's good for probably maybe a good chunk of maybe 60 to 70 percent of managers that have autonomy in their job can freely come and go, let's say. Right. That rule may not work as well for people that are lower on the on the ladder and have, uh, you know, have jobs where they're, you know, stuck to a phone, they don't have Bluetooth, you know, things like that. Like all those things have been popping up, which I've been discovering over the past couple of years. Yeah, you must just, just kind of bump into a lot of those real world barriers a lot, mm -hmm. a lot more. Because yeah. you think about it, you're like, oh, I read the research, it said do this. And then that's never the same as what, what <laughs> yeah. office culture really looks like. Yeah, it's been a real interesting kind of fruitful area for me to work on where it's like, okay, I want to figure out how to do research well, but I want to solve a problem that I'm interested in, which is this whole sitting thing. But it's, you know, it's, and you got to figure out how to get the data. So the Fitbits, that's been pretty good. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like I'm kind of on the path to figure, you know, if I can figure out in the year and a half that I have left, like who's going to be the, the best population to work with that would be the most responsive to my intervention of just like feedback and goal setting and maybe a little something else, you know, maybe some type of uh, contingent reinforcement, reinforcement is good. Right. And so it's like, you know, what I'm kind of discovering, it's like somebody that needs to be in, you know, maybe in their job for a couple of years has, you know, values health, of course, that that's why they'd opt into my research and maybe a couple other characteristics. So then I can identify, okay, those are the common things that you have to have going on for just this, you know, package to work. And if you have X number of you, uh, you don't have a good, you know, your manager doesn't support you and you have other very restrictive work contingencies, like you're, you know, you have to stay at the front desk, things like that. Then it, you could almost kind of navigate of like, okay, well, the kind of classic OBM, like you have to have support from the top and say, okay, well, this population of workers, you need to have these supports in place. And if not, then you can't expect them to be active because, you know, the workplace is the environment in which they behave. Have you ever thought about looking into some of the money that, you know, that, that gets lost through sick days or through um, oh, sure, people yeah. complaining about, oh, I'm injured or my back hurts or, you know, any of the any of the injuries? And I, and I think it would be hard to make the case. And because they didn't get up every hour, all these yeah. horrible things happen. But you can <laughs> right. say yeah, these exactly. things are correlated. So maybe you're losing this much money. Uh, but does that ever kind of cross your mind or is that sort of yeah, outside the realm? That, oh, yeah. I've, I've thought about it a lot. I've actually um, I've written a couple articles about this. So I have to link it to your guys' notes after, oh, after we great. get off the yes, show here. Yes, yes. Um, so I think just from a behavioral standpoint, when we're looking at productivity metrics in general, most of them are just delayed. And so common business metrics are going to be sick days and and uh, absentee data, which is uh, yeah, sick days or presentee data. Have you guys heard of what presenteeism is? No. <laughs> so present, yeah, so presenteeism is when you go to work, but you're not actually doing a very good job at work. So you might oh. show up and you like, so you might be there typing at the computer, but you're not like getting anything done. You could be sick or thinking about a family emergency. So you're present, but you're not getting your stuff done. Where absenteeism is you're sick 
um, in the hospital, things like that. Oh, um, the, so the presenteeism PTO is a hidden cost. Yeah, so it's people are showing up. They're not, they're not getting any work done. And right. so that can be formally like measured. So when you look at like the like the productivity data then, so a company might take productivity data and look at like our function of these types of variables of presenteeism and absenteeism and you know how much work you put out and everything. But those are really best suited for like large companies that have analysts that can go yeah. into their corporation and do these audits and figure it out. And then, you know, you get these numbers of, you know, this thing in our company is costing us or, you know, let's say low back pain is costing us costing us a hundred thousand dollars a year because we have all these employees that are getting hurt on the job or sitting too much. And so mm -hmm. you have to have large, large data sets. So those consequences are super delayed and it takes a while to figure that stuff out. And yeah. so for small companies like ABA clinics, like who I'm talking to now, you know, you're just worried about, you know, driving safely on the roads now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you only have maybe 50 to hundred employees and you're worried about safety when it comes to, you know, physical management, things like that. And so, I mean, when you get to larger companies, there, there'll be some some data in there. But when we're talking about productivity and health in the workplace, to circle it back to sitting now, it's like, okay, if you go sit down, you're not automatically going to just stop working. You know, it's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of other things. You're not all of a sudden just going to die from sitting down all of a sudden. Yeah. And, and your, so all your paraprofessionals are like 24 years old. You know, they mm -hmm. might only be in the job with you for a few years. So you're not sure. likely to see the repercussions of that sitting. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so I think a lot of the times, you know, I, I kind of liken this. You see all these blogs that kind of have the, hey, 13 hacks to improve your productivity, you know, and, you know, turn, you know, turn the lighting down, open a, open a breeze, light a candle, like those type things. It's like, <laughs> like the productivity we're actually interested in is like the here and now, like what's, what's happening immediately. But the data that actually matches up to productivity takes like a year or two to figure out. So, yeah. There's a there's a big disconnect there, and so now and now you take that issue of productivity and try to plug health into it, then it complicates things even more. Like okay, now if I'm sitting too long, then you can actually start feeling like the pain. You know, the you get low back pain from sitting in an awkward position. So when you stand up and walk around, and this is well documented in the ergonomics literature that mm -hmm. it is like the easiest, easiest and most common way to relieve back pain is to kind of stand up and walk around. Yeah. And so that's a, you know, it would be a negative reinforcer for us that, hey, we did something, it removed the pain, so I'll keep doing it. And so eventually, if you get into the standing and moving more kind of revolution that, that my movement about movement, then, you know, you get stronger back legs and uh, you might do it a little bit more. And then it has the, you know, the side benefits of your, your increasing blood flow and then um, you can think better because your brain has more blood and you can breathe better. And so those are kind of the informal benefits that are just super hard to quantify but most of the people that i've talked to they, they get like oh yeah I, once i stand up and work it's it's a game changer yeah so nick have you have you done any either in research or sort of just looking at the impact of say like the standing desks versus the traditional desks have you looked into that anymore because i know you were you were getting the rep as a standing um, guy last time we yeah talked. i haven't um i haven't done anything formally um my colleague uh Julie Slowiak, she's been doing some research with her lab up in uh, Minnesota, Duluth. I'm looking at like like specific productivity typing versus uh, as it relates to like standing still versus sitting versus like walking a treadmill, like with a um, like a research like typing task. And I think she's been writing that up or submitted it. So hopefully it'll come out soon and we can all take a peek at it. Yeah. Um, I know she specifically has done some things, but I haven't. It could be something I could like, squeeze into a dissertation that would be an interesting kind of antecedent intervention to examine of like, okay, you know, you get somebody who wants to move more just because I give you a standing desk and I have another post on this, like mm -hmm. standing still all day isn't great either. You still need to leave your desk and walk away. And so you still have to compete with like, oh, I, I'm only, I'm only going to write one more paragraph or one more email. And then two hours later, you see mm -hmm. you, you haven't left your desk and you still need to you know, get around. So it's not about the standing desk. It's about, you know, moderation and breaking everything up. And so mm -hmm. I would like to get there if, if my time allows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, um, but it's a just... very, it's a very, very important uh, kind of real world application question of say, you know, standing desks are great, but um, other research that's coming out are just about the adoption is um, you see the adjustable ones that are mechanical yeah. and go up and down that, Hey, after a while, um, people aren't using them 
as much anymore. So that could be a whole nother oh. business opportunity. Like, okay, you bought, you bought health for your employees. You bought them all standing desks. Let's see if they're actually using it. Are you measuring them? Yeah. Um, desk, it just automatically you, goes up. <laughs> right. It comes yeah. back down and you just keep following it. <laughs> right. There, I have seen some kind of innovative ones that have like timers built in and like just start like moving. If it, it'll be in a, it'll be in a sitting position. And then like after a while you haven't moved or manually brought it up, it'll like stand up automatically. So that's gotta be a different experience if you're typing and all of a sudden your computer starts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Going towards the ceiling. But um, that sounds infuriating. Yeah. I think I would, I think I would rather stand all day or sit all day than have to like occasionally like, Oh Jesus Christ, where's yeah. my desk going? I gotta follow it. Uh, you're right, right, right. Yeah, you, I mean, gotta it go might back be okay forth. unless you have like a bunch of like hot coffee and stuff on there. You're like, oh my god, oh my god, all your papers are like, like flying everywhere. Up, That's yeah, what really I'm picturing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I just remember back to the last time we talked, and we sort of talked about kind of response effort and sort of the pillars of the pillars of health. And yeah. the only way to make the change is you need to pick the pillar that is probably going to be the easiest for you to start. Mm-hmm. And so certainly. For me, just hearing about your work on the movement, oh, that sounds so much easier than completely changing my diet or making myself right. sleep. More sleep, actually, I think was the hardest when we were talking. I just felt like changing mm-hmm. my sleep schedule seems so hard compared to even getting into an right. exercise routine. Actually, since we last talked, I am in somewhat of an exercise routine. I, someone Ooh. had a standing desk they didn't use, so I, I was like, I'm, I got a new desk, and I, I said, I'll yeah. put the standing desk on top. Oh, I'll try that out. That and my sleep still sucks my diet's better too but my sleep's still terrible i don't want to change it. yeah I mean, as long as you kind of chip away i mean what do yeah. we call this we call it shaping you know whatever your 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 ideal goal is you know at the end of the day it's like you you know you're working on it and that's going to make you feel better and you know loosely speaking you're more aware of your health targets now exactly so i know that yeah. that, that, that the movement was really kind of one that that for a lot of workspaces probably be the one of the easier entries into better health have you thought about are there other other areas that either like businesses or if you've had folks talk oh, i really want to get like our, our our office or our floor to do a big exercise group together has anyone come to you mm-hmm. with a with a problem problem of that that caliber um yeah so i've been kind of working with a couple companies here and there with different interests one i can kind of think of is hey we want to start like a wellness program we want you know we get we have a company it's a telehealth model and you know not everybody shares an office so it could be difficult to um, get everybody together on the same page and you know you could see like you want to build some community but you know you don't have like hey we, we, we can't get everybody together for group yoga you know at the same time and so I kind of have been working with this group and I'd say like okay you started a Facebook page but like what's the reason for the Facebook page like what are you guys trying to get out of it and and, and the main thing I think just with kind of shaping with the p- pillars it's like there's a there's tons to do you could hire a cook you could have a personal trainer come in but i think the biggest thing is kind of starting small and simple like what is it that you can maintain at a at a decent frequency over the next couple weeks couple months that would be uh you know an easy and noticeable change you know both you know you know for you as an individual employee and for, and for the company because um we all have day jobs and we're all doing things i'm doing research and writing all day you know you guys are doing this awesome podcast and doing your clinical work. So it's like, you can't do everything at once, but what's something small that you can, can you start with? And so I think, I think uh, starting there with companies has been pretty, pretty helpful um, mm-hmm. so far. Take, take yourself, Rob, are you, do you work at a, a do you work at, in schools? Do you come and go or you, do you have a standalone clinic? No, it's schools. So I come and go. So I go to different schools okay. and I have a lot yeah. of opportunities to move. That's for sure. Okay, but you have, I mean, other employees within the company, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so for maybe for you, it makes sense if you're, let's say, you're the champion of health in your organization. That's like, hey, I want to get healthier because Nick told me to, and that <laughs> seems to be a good, re- seems like a good reason to do things. And you say, okay, well, let's make a support group, and then you got to find out, like, well, what what different areas of health are people interested in? Are mm-hmm. people interested in more food? Are people interested in health? And that all, you know, you're just getting feedback for your environment. But again. You know, being super, you know, very small because even with my own, my own blog, like I just started with a blog and then I learned about how to do a website. And um, then I learned about, you know, maybe putting all this information together in a workshop and then that mm-hmm. helps fuel my research and things like that. So it kind of mm-hmm. all snowballs and relates and we all have kind of different career goals and everything, but just starting small and you can never know, you, you know, you never know where it could lead, you know, obviously with 
healthy behavior change being at the forefront. Exactly. Well, Nick, uh, I th- we've been we've been having a great conversation here, but I think it's about time for us to wrap up because we are sure, taking no up problem. all your time. I know you said there were no time constraints, but I also don't want to take advantage. Of- <laughs> oh no, you're fine. No, it's good. you can't. You can never pass up good conversations. Exactly. <laughs> So for those of you waiting for the second secret code, I want to make sure you get that. And it is meander, M-E-A-N-D-E-R. Let's meander over to this standing desk and put it in the seated position and sit down for a little bit. Meander. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not all who wander are lost, Rob. <laughs> Not all who meander are lost. <laughs> Oh boy! Well, Nick, thank you so much. It was really great that we could get you on. Uh, and, and yeah, you're It was welcome. kind of short notice. It all just kind of worked out, and then you got to be yeah. a guest, and you got to be our our, our secret secret guest co-host for today. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't it was, super, it was super. Yeah, it was super fun to uh, talk about some research with with you two and uh, think about it um, just with different angles. And um, yeah, it was really fun. I I enjoyed being a co-host. So if you if you ever need me to fill in again, I'd, I'd be happy to do it. Excellent. Awesome. Thank well, we so will hold much. you. We hold all our guests if they say they'll come back. We're like, oh, oh you're contractually obligated. It's yeah. now. So again, Nick, where can everybody find you online? Yeah, everybody can find me at www.behaviorfit.com. That's all one word: b e h a v i o r f i t dot com. And you can email me directly at nick at behaviorfit dot com. And I'm pretty active on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and um, LinkedIn. So you can just Google forward slash behavior fit and it will pop up and you will find me. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, and you just spoke at uh, the Miami conference and any, yeah. anything else coming up, coming down the pipeline that you know of? Yeah, I just spoke at that. The, uh, the conference in Miami was called the next gen revolution summit conference. And I don't quote me on this, but I think they, they may be uh, publishing some of the, uh, some of the talks online. So you can maybe look, look there for some of the talks. It was really neat. It was about, health and entrepreneurship and technology and behavior analysis it was really neat coming down the pipeline um yeah still conducting research and i have another article to uh, write up so hopefully we'll see a couple coming in the next year and then um, i'll be going to san diego and we'll be uh, having a panel discussion about health and technology and entrepreneurship there so if you um, are going to be there in san diego i'd love to meet all the listeners and uh, answer any questions while i'm there and we will certainly have any links that we can. And, and Nick's going to make sure to, to share some relevant articles on our Facebook page. And we're abainsidetrack.com, Facebook slash abainsidetrack.com, all that stuff. You can find us there on Twitter. Or you can email us too at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you'd like, you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. But specifically, we love it when people leave us reviews either on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher uh, or, or on the Facebook page where apparently you can leave reviews. We found out a couple months ago. And it's been really nice to see, to get feedback from, from listeners as well. Well, I guess that's going to do it for all of us here. Nick, thank you again so very much for coming on. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and Diana, thank you also for being here. I don't want to forget you. Oh, you bet. All right. Step it up. (laughs) We'll Mm -hmm. be back next week with our preview episode. But until then, everybody, keep responding. Bye. Bye now.